Hey guys and welcome back to an amazing new video. In this video I will show you how you can measure the performance of your app. And with performance I mean things like how long does it take to launch your app. Um, I mean performance for critical user journeys. So for example scrolling, clicking on an item, getting to a detailed screen and just measuring for example how many frames are dropped, how fast all that stuff is. So I will show you a way how you can on the one hand measure that, how you can automate measuring that performance um, so you don't always need to do that manually or at least you don't need to write any scripts for it all the time instead you can just click a button to measure your performance and then in the next video I will show you a way how you can optimize that performance so once you know the performance of your app I will show you a way how you can optimize that with baseline profiles to in the end optimize the experience for your user base so in Android Studio, the little app that we'll build or that you will actually just get from my GitHub, um, so we won't build any app here, it's a very simple one, so you can just find the code down below. Uh, we will just have a single click me button here, and if we click that, we will simply add an element to this lazy column in this case. And then, yeah, once we added some more items, we can also scroll. So we will be measuring the scrolling performance here. So we will check if there are any frames that are dropped, how fast that scrolling is. And also, if we click on an item, for example, element 12, we will get to a detail screen that says element 12. So this is our very simplified um, list and detail screen app that we will measure the performance of and then optimize it in the next video. And the tool that we will use for that is the Jetpack Macro Benchmark Library. So a macro benchmark is in the end, yeah, kind of a big benchmark. So we, we measure the main, the main performance points, main performance factors of our app, for example, launch, um, scrolling, all the stuff that I just mentioned. And there's also micro benchmark to just measure um, more like, like smaller elements of our app. So get the code down below and then let's jump into it. The first thing I wanna do is we want to create a new module, a new Gradle module to be specific. And for that, we want to switch from the Android to the project view. And then here in our root module, root project uh, directory, we want to right click a new module. Because with this um, Jetpack Macro Benchmark Library, there we have this special benchmark type for a module. And here we can kind of configure that. We don't really need to configure anything. So if you were to run a micro benchmark, you would need to check that here. But we are using a macro benchmark here. We target our application module, obviously, since that's the app we want to benchmark. We give it a name benchmark, that's fine. The package name is fine. So we can just click finish and it will also, yes, that's just for Git. So we can click don't ask again, click add. And then Android Studio will actually generate this kind of example startup benchmark class for us. And you can see there's an example startup benchmark. It navigates to the device's home screen, launch the default activity. And before running this benchmark, we should switch our app's active build variant in the studio. So we need to make sure that if we run this, we actually need to have the um, selected build variant being equal to benchmark. And then we need to add this profilable tag to our manifest, which Android Studio already did for us. So if we take a look in our app directory, source main manifest, then we see that it added this profilable tag here so that our app is actually well profilable and the profiler can get data about the benchmarks. And if we take a look in here, then a benchmark, uh, at least in regards to uh, Jetpack macro benchmark, is in the end just an instrumented test. So that is a test that runs on an Android device, obviously, because we want to test or we want to benchmark things like the app launch time, then of course our app needs to run on an actual device. And here we have such a benchmark rule, which just gives us the testing behavior for benchmarking and it added a startup function, which is our very simple basic test case here, which will measure our app's performance. So we specify our package name, which is fine. The metrics, um, here we basically define what we want to measure. So in this case, we want to just measure the startup timing metric. So we just yeah measure how long does it take to launch the app. We um, specify how many iterations, so how often should the benchmark library actually do this because there, there can of course be some uh, deviations so it won't always be the exact same amount of milliseconds it takes to launch your app so we just do this um, multiple times so we can be we just have a more accurate value and we have a startup mode 
which is currently set to cold. So this will be, this will just mean that your app is not launched at all. So it will take the absolute longest time to launch. So for example, if the user just has a fresh install of your app, then this would be startup mode cold. We also have warm, which I think um, it's just a little bit faster. I think your activity is already kind of in the background or so. And we have hot, um, which is like the, the fastest startup mode. So your activity is probably fully in memory and the user just goes back to your app. So I'm not sure about the exact differences here, but cold is just what we're interested in here. Um, so we just measure the the um, performance for that mode. Something we should also make sure is that for all this benchmark and baseline profile stuff, we should not obfuscate the code for that build. So that means if you're using R8, which you usually are for your release build, and it's always a good idea to um, run these performance benchmarks and like baseline profile measurings on the release build because that's the closest to what your or that is actually what your users have on their device and the debug build can lead to some deviations as well we will still be using the debug build here because for the release build we need like um, a key store we need to sign our apk um, but just that i have mentioned that um, that usually you should use the release build for that but um, yeah we still want to kind of avoid that this build for benchmarking and measuring the performance does not get obfuscated and to do that we can go to our app um, module and we can create a new file so new file and we can call this benchmark rules.pro so we just define product rules for yeah just the benchmarking build so we can say don't obfuscate then it won't obfuscate anything it's just the same as our product rules dot profile which applies to our actual release build and this applies to our benchmark build we can then go to benchmark our new module go to build at gradle and here in our benchmark gradle under benchmark which is our build type here we can specify ProGuard files and just mention our benchmark rules.pro here and then click synchronize now. And if we now go to our example startup benchmark, we can actually click run here or just um, here. So I actually have my physical device launched. That's also quite important that you do these benchmarks on an actual device, not on an emulator, because again, that is just the closest to um, a real life scenario. So I will run this here, run example startup benchmark, and then this one will probably show up because we are in the wrong build type or build variant. Um, so to fix that, we can go to build, select build variant, and here you can see our app module is currently in the debug build variant, but we want it to be in the benchmark one. So we can click that, try that again, run, and then this will work just fine. If we take a look here on my device, then we will see what, um, what the library here will actually do for us in terms of measuring the performance of our app launch time until Gradle actually finished building. And we do get an error. Let's see, baseline profiles aren't supported on this device version. So that usually means we are just missing a dependency, um, which we need to actually install these baseline profiles. Right now we don't have any baseline profiles we wanna apply and I thought we only need that for the next video, but it seems like we also need this for measuring the performance. So we can just uh, go to build at Gradle app and all we need to do is we need to add a dependency here down there which is the profile installer so that dependency will just be needed to install a baseline profile um, we will get more into baseline profiles and what that is in the next video we can click synchronize now go back to example startup benchmark and actually relaunch that test case and hopefully now it will succeed we we'll take a look here in visor now it will start to run it doesn't fail at least immediately it will launch our app launch it again launch it again and it will, it will now do that five times to then finally give us the launch results you can see that succeeded and here we get this time to initial display milliseconds so that is the time amount in milliseconds how long it took until the app was um in the initial display state kind of until it was initially displayed and usually what you care about is this median value here um, so you also get the minimum and maximum values but you can see there can be quite some um, difference between these the median value is kind of yeah, just the the middle value of all your iterations so it took 168 milliseconds to 
um, get to the initial display state. So now you already know how we can measure the amount of time it takes for our app to launch. But as I said, we also like to measure other performance metrics. For example, how our app behaves when the user is actually scrolling or when they take critical user journeys. So with critical user journeys, I just mean things um, most of your users are very likely to do when they launch your app. For example, you have some kind of um, note app and the user will open your app and it's very likely or very many users might just directly start a search for notes um, so they type something in a text field uh, then uh, there will be a filtering for notes they will click on a note maybe edit it or so that might be a user journey and we can also optimize our app for these specific user journeys to just be faster in these scenarios and to measure that we can write a different kind of performance test here so in our example star benchmark we can actually just copy this and paste it down below and let's call this main, or let's call it scroll. So we will just test um, the scroll performance. But we'll also click on, um, let's call it scroll and navigate. Um, but we'll also click on an item on our text to actually get to the detail screen to also measure this performance. This time, we are not interested in the starter timing metric. So we don't want to measure that. Instead, we want to measure the frame timing metric. So here we just get information about frame counts, how many frames were skipped and things like that. Um, we still want to um, leave this here. So we still want to press home and start the activity in an initial state. Um, this must happen in every iteration. But now you can see we get this macro benchmark scope. And with this scope, it's, it's kind of similar as um, using Espresso or the Compose UI testing library. We can now use this with another library, which is called UI Automator, to find views in our UI and then basically perform actions on these. And that is what we will now do. So actually outside of our test class, I will just write a little extension function so we can reuse this. Um, macro benchmark scope dot add elements, scroll and scroll down, for example. And that is what our function will do here. And then we could, um, first of all, find a reference to our button, this click me button that just added um, our text to our lazy column, because we obviously need to tell our UI automator that it should click this button and yeah, simulate clicks on that. So we can say val button is equal to device that comes from this macro benchmark scope dot find object. And now we have this by selector which you can use to um, just yeah, tell it how it should find that button. And the easiest way to find something is just by text. So we can say by text and the text for a button is click me. If we take a look at main activity here, you can see that's exactly the type of text that is on our button. Cool. We might also want to get a reference to our list, to our lazy column, because we then want to say, hey, on that list, you should now scroll. You should perform a scroll action. So we can say val list this device, find object. But what do we do now? Now we can say by text because our list doesn't really have a text. Um, and for those of you who are really familiar with Compose UI testing, you know that test tags are a thing in Jetpack Compose. And since this UI automator library is actually, um, was initially written for XML, um, it doesn't know this concept of test tags, which it now does because it is interoperable with Compose. But we need to do some, some kind of um, changes to our Compose UI to be able to work with this UI automator. So in main activity, we first of all need to go to our root composable, which is navhost, add a modifier. And here we say modifier dot semantics. And here we can say, um, how is it called? Resource test tags as resource ID. And we set that to true. So in this case, now we also need to add this experimental stuff here as usual with Compose. Um, so that means that it will use all the test tags as resource IDs. And we can find views by their resource ID using this by RAS. So in here we could say item list, for example. And if we then give our lazy column this test tag, then we can also find it, um, find this list that way. So here in our lazy column, we can go to our modifier and just say test tag is item list and then it will also find our list. Cool. So what do we do next? Um, at first, our list does not have any items. We need to click the button first. So let's say we repeat 30 times that we add, that we click the button. So button.click, that's how we do this. 
it will click the button 30 times, therefore it will add 30 text to our list, so it will have enough items to be scrollable. We can then say device done wait for idle, so just waiting for the idle condition until we can do some actions again. And the next thing will then be to perform the actual scroll, get, uh, scroll gesture. So we can say list dot set gesture margin, and we set it to device dot display width divided by five. So what does this do? It will simply kind of shrink down the um, gesture margin. So we, we just want to make sure that with our scroll gesture, we don't accidentally trigger the actual device gestures, for example, for navigation or so. So we really just want to make sure that the margin for that is given. And we can then say list dot either scroll or we can say dot fling, which will uh, just be like a, a scroll gesture. We can say direction down. So we want to scroll down and that will yeah, perform our scroll. Once we scroll down, we want to click on the last element of our list. So we can say device, find object, and the last element will have the text element 29 because we run our um, here we have, we click on the button 30 times, it will start at index zero. So the last element will be 29. And when, then we want to simply click on that, which will perform our navigation. And then all we want to do here for this test case or for this function is we want to wait until our detail screen is fully loaded. And we can do this using device.wait. And here we can pass a wait condition. So until when do we want to wait? And we write it exactly like that. So until it has an object, until there is a specific object on the screen, which has the text. And if we take a look in main activity, it should have the text, detail colon and our text. So text is just the element we clicked on. So until it has the text detail colon element 29, and we pass a timeout condition. So let's say after five seconds, we would simply go on with this test here if it can't find this element. And that's now, yeah, how we tell our macro benchmark library what it should do on our screen while measuring the performance. In this case, the frame timing performance. So we can now go inside the scroll and navigate function and add this add elements and scroll down function, which it will do in every single iteration now. And yeah, now we could measure that. So if we go to this um, play icon and click run, scroll and navigate. Then take a look in visor. We should hopefully see that the test does what it is supposed to do. You can see it clicks our um, button 30 times, scrolls down to element 29. It then hopefully clicks on 29. Yes, and it gets to the detail screen, verifies that the item is there. And now it will do that for four more times five times in total since we specified five iterations. And once that's done, I will see you back here. And there we go, here are our results. And here we get two values. On the one hand, frame duration CPU milliseconds and frame overrun milliseconds. And we actually, for each of these, we get these P50, P90, P95 and so on. So what does this value represent? This is in the end, the amount of time it took the CPU to kind of complete processing that specific frame. So for example, here we have six milliseconds. Here we have 15.4 milliseconds and so on. So these P50, P90 values, these basically refer to percentiles. So that is um, a concept from statistics. And here in this context, it would kind of mean that most of the frames are actually this fast than a few outliers. There are always a few outliers in statistics. Um, so which are basically um, above the 90th percentile in this case, um, were rather slow. And then of course, the, the higher this percentile value gets, the slower the frames will be. So um, the last 1% of the frames were actually very slow, uh, but obviously that's not the case for most of the frames. So you just get some kind of distribution here to assess how bad your problem really is. And then we have this frame over on milliseconds where we actually get negative values for, at least partly, what does that mean? Um, this time value here for frame over on milliseconds means how much time a specific frame missed its deadline by. So when the deadline is, for example, okay, at, at this given timestamp, the frame actually needs to be completed for the UI to still be smoothly scrollable or so, then a negative value means that it was actually faster than the deadline. So that is a good thing. The lower this value, the better. 
And of course, if that's a positive value like here, that means it missed the deadline by 44 milliseconds. So it was actually expected to be completely um, processed 44 milliseconds earlier, but it actually yeah, wasn't. It was just too late. And it's completely normal that you will also have positive values here, which is quite like your app doesn't always run at exactly 60 FPS or so, um, but it's just... Yeah, you can use this as an indicator if you really have a lag problem. Um, so the larger these values are, the more lag your app, your app will actually have, the more jank you will experience. Um, but yeah, you in the end, you also need to kind of try it out on your own if it's really a problem. Um, I'm not a friend of actually optimizing performance just for the sake of optimizing performance, only if you actually see that has an actual effect on the user base. For example, I saw some uh, studies from Uber which is of course an app that millions of people have. And if Uber optimizes their startup performance by let's say 40%, so their app launches 40% faster, that's of course um, a really, really good thing because it will save time of millions of people. And if that makes them stay longer in the app and book more kind of Uber rides, then that means cash for Uber. But if you on the other hand have an app that has like 50 users and you focus on these mini performance optimizations to make your app some milliseconds faster, when you should actually be focusing on what makes your app usable for users and what improves their user experience in terms of like features, in terms of optimizations of what you already have, then you should of course rather focus on that. So it's really always dependent on the type of app you have, how bad the problem really is, whether you should um, spend time optimizing performance or not. But if you want to learn how you can optimize performance, then definitely watch the next video about baseline profiles. So when that is out, you will find it here. So click there, watch the next video. It is definitely interesting for every Android developer out there. And I'll see you back in the next video. Thanks for watching. Enjoy your week. Bye bye.